I, be, I preached a message last Sunday entitled Salt and Light, how Jesus told us to be salt as a preservative in society and light to bring the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the goodness and the truth of Jesus Christ to the world. And I'm going to continue on that theme uh, this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and I want to draw particular attention to that last verse, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That is the key verse in the book of Luke. It describes Jesus' purpose. It describes what drove him, what motivated him during his ministry here on earth. The title of my message today is... Uh, how to make a difference. How to make a difference. You know, it's so easy to look at the news and to look at what's happening in our nation and our world and to be so overwhelmed and overcome and depressed and discouraged. And if the thought of making a difference in the world, I know that's a cliche, but uh, we know what we mean by making a difference. If the, if the thought of making a difference in our world comes across our minds, we, we can just be uh, more overwhelmed and, and ask the question, how can I make a difference? The world is so uh, big and the, 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 the problems and the situations in the world are so massive. How can I, as one believer, make a difference? Well, Jesus was one individual on earth. Now, he was the Son of God. But oh, what a difference he made. And we are called to model our lives after Jesus Christ. You see, that's the key. The more I can become like Jesus, the more potential I have for making a difference. How many believe that this morning? Amen. Amen. If we want to make a difference, we should seek to model our lives after him. And so in this passage this morning, uh, we're going to look at the life of Jesus. Uh, we're going to look at the life of the master. And if we as believers uh, have any kind of ambition to make a difference in the world around us, I believe we need to do what Jesus did. And so this morning I uh, want to share four principles that if you and I would adopt them, we can make a difference in the world around us. So I want to share them with you. And they're all from this passage, all from what Jesus did here in Luke 19. What's the first principle for you and I to make a difference in the world around us? First of all, let me ask, how many want to make a difference? About almost half. That's good. <laughs> How many want to make a difference in the world around us? I believe we all do. How can we do that? Number one, involve yourself in people's lives. Involve yourself in people's lives. In verse 5, it says, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. There was a crowd pressing around Jesus. Zacchaeus was a short little man. We used to sing that song in Sunday school. 
Zacchaeus was a short little man. A short little man was he. Some of you remember that? And he couldn't see over the crowd around him. So what did he do? He climbed up on a tree. He got a better vantage point. And Jesus came to where he was and singled him out. I mean, that would be like, uh, and, and of course, we're, we're not all full today because of current events, but, you know, that would be like in the middle of the sermon, you know, the preacher coming down off the platform. I'm getting off camera here. I don't know if you guys can follow me, but it would be like the preacher coming out of uh, the, the, the platform and going up to an individual and says, hey, I want to have a conversation with you, buddy. You're okay with that, right? <laughs> You're not a short little man, though. <laughs> Jesus centered in on him. Jesus focused in on him. Jesus got involved in his life. You know, we live in a messy world. How many would agree with that? <laughs> and... Uh, some of us, if we were to be honest, we'd say, Pastor Tim, I try really, really hard not to get involved in people's lives. Isn't that right? Come on, I have enough of my own issues. I have enough of my own problems. Why in the world would I want to involve myself in someone else's problems, someone else's issues? But see, Jesus did that all the time. And that's what his people do if they want to make a difference. They look for opportunities. I don't mean force yourself on people and become a nuisance and, you know, just, uh, you know, do it without tact and without grace. But if we look around, there are opportunities to involve ourselves in people's lives, to get in the middle of their messes. And Zacchaeus was a mess. He was a tax collector. Tax collectors were among the most despised people in that day and age because they worked for the Roman occupiers of, uh, who were occupying uh, the, the land where the Jews lived. And so they, they worked for the government. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, what, what President Ronald Reagan used to say, some of the most feared words are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, you know. And so, so they were despised. And his life was a mess. It, it, was, it was synonymous with the office of tax collector that they were cheaters, that they cheated people out of their uh, finances. That may be another reason he climbed up in the tree, get away from the crowd. But Jesus involved himself in his life. You know, the people who make the most difference in our lives are people who have involved ourselves, themselves in our lives. Amen? A recent email asked readers to reflect on the following questions. See how you do, just quickly, mentally with this. Name the five wealthiest people in the world. Name the last five Heisman Trophy winners. Name the last five winners of the Miss America contest. How you doing? <laughs> Name uh, uh, ten people who have won the Nobel or the Pulitzer Prize. Can you do that? Name the last half dozen Academy Award winners for Best Actor and Actress. Or how about this? Name the last ten World Series winners. How can you do? Pretty good? As you reflect on these six questions, you realize that very few of us would know the answers to even one of those. But then the email followed with another set of questions. Number one, list a few teachers who aided your journey through school. That's a little easier, isn't it? Name three friends who have helped you through a difficult time. Name five people who taught you something worthwhile. Number four, think of a few people who have made you feel appreciated and special. Number five, think of five people you enjoy spending time with. Number six, name six heroes whose stories have inspired you. You get the point, don't you? It's the people who have been involved in your life that make a difference. Not, not celebrities and not well-known people. They, 
uh, they're there, but they don't make a difference. The people involved in your life make a difference. And so we can make a difference when we involve ourselves in other people's lives. Wouldn't it be great to be that latter set of questions? Wouldn't it be great for you and me to be on some of those people's lists, uh, answers to those questions? If Jesus made a difference by being involved in people's lives, how did he do it? He went out and got among the people. This was an unplanned parade, and Jesus was the master of ceremonies, and yet he involved himself in Zacchaeus' lives. It's been noted, his, his life, it's been noted that the longer we stay in church, the fewer non-church friendships we developed, and this is a natural phenomenon. But if we're going to make a difference, we need to involve ourselves in the lives, the messy lives of people around us, people who need Jesus. This morning... How can you involve yourself in people's lives so as to make a difference in their lives? Would you think about that? Would you ponder that? How can you get involved in their life? Involving ourselves in other people's lives is the beginning of making a difference. What's the second thing we need to understand from Jesus' example uh, to make a difference? It's number two, insulate yourself from unjust criticism. Insulate yourself from unjust criticism. Verse 7 says, All the people saw this and began to mutter, He, meaning Jesus, has gone to be the guest of a sinner. See, Zacchaeus, I said, was a tax collector. He, that was just synonymous with sinner. And Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, and that set the tongues to wagon, didn't it? How many know pretty much anything you try and do for Jesus, tongues will wag? People will whisper. People will say uncomplimentary things. And this was a big deal. Who, whom you ate with, uh, eating, uh, especially at one's home, was synonymous with fellowship. It was synonymous with acceptance. So Jesus eating at Zacchaeus' house, it, it, it said, you are fellowshipping with sinners. You, and, and so... Uh, you and I need to get ready. If we want to make a difference, we need to prepare to be criticized. We need to prepare to be misunderstood. How many love to be criticized? You love it? <laughs> I didn't expect any hands on that. Most of us don't love to be criticized. How many really enjoy being misunderstood and misrepresented? I got no hands that. For those of you watching online, no hands went up. Nobody does. But now, how many know you will be misunderstood and criticized when you try and do something for Jesus? When you get step into messiness. If it happened to Jesus, guess what? It's going to happen to you and to me. And so we need to insulate ourselves from that. We need to prepare ourselves for that. We need to be able to deflect that. Jesus said, if, if the world has hated me, guess what? They're going to hate you too. Amen. He didn't say maybe. He said that's what's going to happen. So you and I have a choice to make. Do we want to make a difference for the kingdom of God and live out our Christian faith with all of its implications? Or do we want to curry favor with everyone around us? Do we want to have the approval of man or the approval of God? That's a choice we make. There will always be criticism. Rotten Reviews, how's that for a title? Uh, is a book uh, that contains some negative reviews of some works of art. Listen to some of the, the, the works of art that have gotten rotten reviews in this book, uh, or that the book chronicles have gotten rotten reviews. Alice in Wonderland, A Tale of Two Cities, the Great Gatsby. Uh, Alice in Wonderland was called stiff and overwrought. Uh, a Tale of Two Cities was called a sheer dead pull from start to finish. And uh, it was said of the Great Gatsby that it deserved a good shaking, whatever that means. There will always be criticism. 
Abraham Lincoln was considered the greatest president in our nation's history, and there were a whole bunch of people who hated him. Criticism was rampant. <laughs> I heard this story. Two taxidermists stopped before a window in which an owl was on display. And, uh, of course, this was their profession, and so they noticed the way the owl was mounted, and they criticized the way it was mounted, and, you know, they said the eyes weren't natural, its wings were out of proportion with its head, and its feathers were not uh, neatly arranged. They said its feet could be improved. And, uh, you know, it was their professional criticism as taxidermists of the way this owl was mounted. And when they'd finished all their criticism... The old owl turned his head and winked at him. Some of you will get that over lunch. You see, there is always an aura of criticism that follows us. And I suppose one lesson we can learn from these stories is to ignore our critics, but that's not always why. Sometimes our critics uh, can be correct. Sometimes they can have valuable criticism if we're willing to hear it. But the point is that sometimes our critics are wrong. Sometimes we will do the right thing and be criticized for it, and we have to insulate ourselves against that and say, I'd rather please God than man. And if, if it involves uh, involving myself in people's messiness and, and doing things that not everyone, will, even those closest to me, will understand, then so be it. But I want to make a difference. Amen? Number three, how to make a difference. Involve yourself in people's lives, insulate yourself from unjust criticism, and influence others to live godly lives. It says here in verse number eight, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. This is incredible. Here was a man who, uh, whose very profession was synonymous with dishonesty, with cheating people. And because of his encounter with Jesus, he said, I am going to give half my position to the poor. I'm going to repay those I've cheated four times the amount I've cheated them. You talk about an about face. What caused this, this change of direction? It was a confrontation with Jesus. It was the influence of Jesus in his life. You see, we Christians, we get accused of being intolerant. We, we get accused of being judgmental. And perhaps in some instances that is a valid criticism. But you see, the Apostle Paul talked in various places about persuading people of the gospel, persuading people about the cause of Christ. And that's what we are in the business of doing, persuading people, influencing people, uh, causing them to take a second look at their lives. If you and I are living for Jesus, if we are living lives uh, not perfect, of course, but worthy of emulating, then we will influence other people to be good. I want to be an influencer. I want to be someone uh, uh, of whom others will say, hey, I like what you have. I want to live like you. That's what Jesus caused in the life of this man, Zacchaeus. He was so impacted. He was so influenced. He said, I've got to change direction in my life. Now, there are times when uh, apt words and, and words that the Lord will give us can make an impact on people. But how many know there are many, many times when words alone won't do it? Because sometimes we think, boy, if I could just convince them of the truth, and we should stand up for truth, don't misunderstand me. We should proclaim the truth, even when it's unpopular. But often our words will not convince people. What will convince them? Our lives, our influence. And, and how awesome would it be for people to be around us and just to see us model uh, Christianity, to see us live like Jesus, and to say, hey, I want to live my life like that. 
How about you this morning? Whether you're here in the sanctuary, watching online, I respectfully ask you, could the way you live your life influence somebody toward good? Could people who closely witness the way you live be influenced to live for Jesus and to follow him and to do good themselves? That's what happened with a, Zacchaeus with an encounter with Jesus. How did Jesus influence Zacchaeus and other people? Well, I believe there are, there are three important elements to that. The first is this. Uh, he earned their respect. Zacchaeus might have expected Jesus to treat him with contempt like everybody else did. Or to act like a holy person. Instead, Jesus was down to earth. He respected Zacchaeus. Say, so Pastor Tim, but, you know, people are godless and they're, they're, they're just living godless lives and they're just so opposed to Christian principles. How can I respect them? You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to give approval of their lifestyle or their belief system, but you need to respect them as an individual created in the image of God. You see, don't, don't buy into what the world says. The world says, if you don't agree with me, if you don't endorse my lifestyle, if you don't uh, approve of uh, what I say or, or my belief system or my lifestyle, then you don't respect me, you hate me, you don't care for me. Listen, that's a lie from the pit of hell. We don't have to compromise truth to show love and respect to the world around us. And make no mistake about it, what's going to make a difference in our, our divided nation and in our world is the love of Jesus Christ. We can hate what people do. We can hate what they stand for. We can hate their ideas and their belief system, but we need to love and respect them. Jesus showed respect to sinners. Secondly, cultivate a relationship with them. Jesus overcame barriers to interact with Zacchaeus. There was a distance barrier. Zacchaeus was up in a tree. Jesus went to where he was. There was the alienation uh, barrier. Zacchaeus felt condemned by other people. Jesus crossed that barrier to build a relationship. Then there was the guilt barrier. Zacchaeus felt guilty for his past life. Jesus broke down that barrier by befriending Zacchaeus. Can you befriend people you don't agree with? Can you go across the barriers? They may not vote the way you do. They may not be politically affiliated the way you are. They may not have the values you have. Can you form a relationship with them without compromising your values? Can you form a relationship? Jesus formed a relationship. So he showed respect, he formed a relationship, and thirdly, he led them to make a response. When the time is right, when we go through the beginning steps of res showing respect, and building a relationship, there'll be a time we can call for a response. The African bish bishop Desmond Tutu was once asked why he became an Anglican rather than joining some other denomination. Bishop uh, Tutu replied that in the days of apartheid, when whenever a black a person and a white person met while walking on a footpath, the black person was expected to step aside to allow the white person to pass and to nod their head as a gesture of respect. That was just the way it was under apartheid. One day, Bishop Tutu said, when I was just a little boy, my mother and I were walking down the street when a tall white man blessed, uh, dressed in a black suit came toward us. He said, before my mother and I could step off the sidewalk, as was expected of us, this white man stepped off the sidewalk, and as my mother and I passed, he tipped his hat in a gesture of respect to her. I was more than surprised, he said, at what had happened, and I asked my mother, why did that white man do that? My mother explained, he's an Anglican priest, he's a man of God, that's why he did it. 
Bishop Tutu says, when she told me that he was an Anglican priest, I decided there and then that I wanted to be an Anglican priest too. And what is more, I wanted to be a man of God. Wow. That's powerful. That's what happens when we allow ourselves to be an influence in the lives of other people. If people were to be influenced by the way you live your life, what difference would it make in their lives and the world around them? If you were to be truthful, would you want to encourage people to live like you? We can influence other people. And fourthly and finally, invest yourself in the cause of the gospel. Jesus said in verses 9 and 10, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus was invested in the cause of the gospel. You know what it means to invest yourself. It means you're all in. It means this is what my life is about. And can I tell you, church, as children of the living God, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be invested in the cause of the gospel. You know, bringing people to Christ and transforming the world around us us shouldn't be a priority, it should be the priority. Amen. That was, as I said at the outset, what Jesus was about. A well, couple things to note. First of all, Jesus prioritized people. People were not an, a, 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 an afterthought with Jesus. See, we get our priorities out of order sometimes in the church. Sometimes we get hung up on the institution. We get caught up in bills and budgets and those sort of things, which we have to deal with, but we make them too much of a priority. We get hung up on our preferences in music and in schedules and, and other things that aren't really that, uh, um, that important and certainly aren't as important as people. Jesus prioritized people. When we are invested in the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ, people are more important than anything else. Prioritizing people. And secondly, Jesus was motivated by a purpose. As I read, verse 10, the key uh, verse in all of the book of Luke, he came to seek and to save what was lost. That purpose was more important than tradition. Tradition said he shouldn't approach Zacchaeus. He certainly shouldn't go to his house for a meal. Jesus' priority was more important than that. Jesus' commitment to his purpose was more important than people's opinions. He didn't care what people said. Jesus' commitment to his purpose was more important than his own comfort. He took the time to love Zacchaeus. invested in the cause of the gospel becomes job number one. And, and you know what you know what I've found and I listen, I, I'm, I'm imperfect as I stand here before you. I'm declaring the perfect word of God. I don't claim to be perfect. I don't claim to have this down perfectly. Uh, but I know in my own life that if I prioritize, the cause of the gospel, if, if, if to the extent I get it right, then people uh, can come to Christ. Uh, but when I focus more on my own preferences and my own comfort and my own desires, I'm not giving as much focus on impacting other people. You all know the story of the Titanic, uh, that it hit an iceberg on its maiden voyage coming to America and uh, after over several hours it sank and there, were, uh, there was a woeful shortage of lifeboats. Uh, and um, as uh, many people fell into the cold ocean, uh, many of the lifeboats were half filled and, and, and most people rode away from the vicinity of the sinking. 
but there was one or two. There, there were one or two boats, which the people uh, commanding them would row back and begin to look for survivors and respond to the cries of help. Most people, even if their boat wasn't full, they didn't want to risk a crowd of people coming onto the boat and overwhelming it and causing it to sink. They were more concerned about their own situation. They were in the boat, but they were more concerned about their own, how it would impact them to bring other potentially dying people onto the boat. But there were, there were one or two who said, there are lives back there. We've got to go back and get them. And, you know, what I've found is for someone who is invested in the cause of the gospel, our focus isn't on what, it, what it's going to cost me, how messy it'll be for me, how inconvenient it'll be for me. Our focus will be that there are people outside the boat. There are people who are dying. There are people who are headed for hell. And I can't prioritize my own safety and comfort and my own convenience over saving lost people. And so I've got to row toward them. I have to move toward them. I have to, why? Because I'm invested in the cause of the gospel. How can I make a difference with my life? Some feel the answer is in politics. Listen, we as Christians should be involved in the political process. We should vote. We should stand up for, for justice and equality and biblical principles. And we should vote, uh, we should vote uh, in according with our biblical principles. And we should speak out on the issues of the day. No question. But the primary way to make a difference isn't through politics. It's through the way we live our lives. And if we follow the example of Jesus, we need to first of all involve ourselves in other people's lives and the day-to-day -day messiness of their lives. Secondly, we need to insulate ourselves from unjust criticism. People will criticize you and me unfairly and unjustly. We need to be ready for it and insulate ourselves from it. Thirdly, we need to influence others to live godly lives so that in the, they see in us uh, a pattern for how they want to live. And fourthly, we need to invest ourselves in the cause of the gospel. Reaching lost people is priority number one.